no other than dr manuria to enlighten us upon this burning issue dr manuria please but one now uh, dr ponde if i will take one second that yes. i have to really appreciate the hard work of dr mahapatra behind the scenes to collect all the people together to collect the people from across the world 12 hours time reference 4 hours time reference 3 hours time reference different geographies to put it together so dr mahapatra has uh, done an excellent job and uh, dr manoria you introduced very well more than than uh, i could you know him for, for more longer time than me but dr manoria is a very close friend of mine and he has been multiple times in our place where i worked and uh, so and i saw we have a really a great pleasure to listen to dr manoria in this forum again dr manoria please thank you thank you dr gratitude Uh, good evening dr fayaz shol dr amrish dr ponde and all of us now for the next 12 to 14 minutes i will be talking on the nuances of myocardial ischemia and revascularization in our day to day practice in patients with chronic coronary syndrome now chronic stable angina is one of the subset of chronic coronary syndrome and this is usually caused by a hemodynamically significant atherosclerotic narrowing of the epicardial artery usually there is myocardial ischemia which is demonstrable and the patient has angina on effort and in such patient sophisticated investigations are not at all required however when there is a disparity between the symptoms and the angiographic findings a patient with borderline stenosis further investigations are certainly required now this is the story of a patient son whose father died of acute myocardial infarction and the family members were very keen to have the angiogram of this son because his father died at 55 years and this is the angiogram and all of us would agree that there is a tight led stenosis and would require angioplasty the son and the family members uh, did not agree for angioplasty as he was totally asymptomatic so he was sent back home and after 2 to 3 weeks somebody had suggested him a myocardial perfusion scan and you can see the perfusion scan was normal so what is the big message from this myocardial perfusion is not merely governed by epicardial stenosis several other factors also play a very important role like the endothelial dysfunction the potency of the microcirculation the collateral formation and the left ventricular hypertrophy and this led to a very important concept of assessing the functional importance of stenotic lesion it is true that in such tight stenosis we usually do not find this mismatch so that when we look at the data if there is a 50 to 70% stenosis 35% may have positive ffr 71 to 90% 80% may have positive ffr and even in the subset of 91 to 90% 96% have a positive ffr 3 to 4% may not have and perhaps this patient belongs to that but this is not a common phenomena and we assess uh, the uh, functional importance of stenotic lesion either by an ffr or a myocardial uh, perfusion in the fame trial and the fame 2 trial was designed to elaborate this concept and all of us know fame showed superiority of a uh, ffr guided approach and functional rather than an atypical revascularization should become the standard of care and the fame 2 trial showed that lesions with a positive ffr less than 0.80 need to be revascularized up front rather than started on an omt so the message from all this is that coronary artery disease has an epicardial component which is always uh, evaluated but many times the microvascular component is forgotten and there will be various combination only epicardial artery no microvascular disease only microvascular disease no epicardial artery and a combination of both the big problem is the nuances of a non obstructive coronary plaques now on occasions all of us seen that when we see intermediate lesions and the ffr test is negative the patient is often told you do not need an intervention and sent back but some of these patient may be harboring a vulnerable plaque 
And if they develop acute coronary syndrome early after being evaluated by CAG and FFR was negative, it is very distressing both to the patient and the cardiologist. And FFR, obviously, you know, is not powered to predict acute myocardial infarction. So what should be done to obviate this phenomena? And can cytokangiography help? I'd also like to have the comments of Dr. Pondé and Dr. Amrish on this phenomena because this is not uncommon. Now, when we look on a CT and U, there is no doubt non-obstructive plaques are also associated with uh, increase in the risk of cardiovascular death and MI. So mere presence of a negative FFR, although excludes functional impo uh, important functional stenosis, but does not exclude an acute coronary event in future. And CTN, you all of us know, is of immense help in picking up the vulnerable plaques, the positive remodeling, as you can see, the napkin sign, the spotty calcification, and so on. And FFR, all of us know, this can also assess the individual lesion stenosis. And after CTN, you all of us see that more statins are prescribed, the adherence to statin therapies increase, and this is the Scott Heart free trial, which showed that after CT angiography, you can see there's a statistically significant reduction in death from coronary heart disease or non-fetal myocardial infarction and non-fetal myocardial infarction alone. Now, this is the second story of a 40 years old male, chest pain on exertion, classical TMT positive, diagnosis angina on effort, coronary angiogram done in another center, normal, Patient was asked to consult a gastroenterologist and psychiatrist. Everything was normal. Patient came to us. We did an angiogram, and as you can see, the epicardial coronary arteries are totally normal. But what is very impressive is the slow flow. The arteries take a lot of time to get cleared, clearly indicating that there is a microvascular problem. And this, again, is a common mistake made by the interventional cardiologist. Now, how do we diagnose microvascular angina? All of us remember that even the stress thallium will be negative in microvascular angina, and this adds to the mistake that thallium is normal, angiogram is normal, patient does not have my. It is the CFR on a PET scan or some other thing clinches the diagnosis of microvascular angina. So what should be our strategy when the problem is faced of microvascular angina? If you have an FFR less than 0 0.80, CFR is more than two, this is a functionally important stenotic lesion, and PCI is the treatment of choice, and it will produce good results because the microcirculation is not compromised. However, if you have an FFR, which is more than 0 0.80, CFR more than 2.0, clearly indicating this has no angina, no anti-ischemic treatment, no microvascular disease, no epicardial disease. On the other hand, if you have an FFR less than 0 0.0, CFR less than 2.0, this means patient has both a flow-limiting stenosis as well as micro uh, microvascular dysfunction, and the results of PCI may not be optimum because following PCI, you may produce distal embolization and the microcirculation, which was already clogged, may further become clogged. And if you have an FFR, which is more than uh, 0.80, CFR less than two clearly indicates there's no flow-limiting stenosis and microvascular angina is present and treatment is only medical treatment, no PCI. Now, what about myocardial perfusion scan? How does it help in prognosticating patient of chest pain? As you can see on the slide, if on a myocardial perfusion scan, you have a small area of myocardial, no perfusion, the long-term prognosis is very good. As you can see, cardiac death or MI rate is negligible over the next few years. What is the relationship between coronary flow reserve and obstructive CAD? Again, you can see, the relationship between coronary flow and obstructive disease, if there is a preserved global CFR in a patient with normal or mild uh, to moderately abnormal MPI virtually excludes a prognostically significant obstructive. So this is the importance of the coronary flow reserve. Now, this is another story of a 62 years old man, history of shortness of breath, chest pain on exertion, a relative of the nuclear cardiologist got his myocardial perfusion scan first because he was uh, related to a nuclear cardiologist. The normal myocardial perfusion scan at rest and immediate after exercise was reported. And the patient was told, you have no coronary artery disease, no angina, but the symptoms continue to increase. And he came to us and we did an angiogram and you see 
uh, multi-vessel disease on a coronary angiogram. So what is this phenomena? This is the phenomena of balanced ischemia, which is seen in five to 10%. If you have a three vessel disease on a coronary angiogram, there may be falsely normal perfusion exhibited on the scan. And what causes this balanced balance ischemia? The radio tracer uptake by different myocardial regions becomes homogeneously distributed secondary to the globalized hypoperfusion in all the segments of the myocardium but can be picked up if you are a little vigilant. It is CFR, which will be decreased in, uh, uh, even with the balance ischemia. CFR in all the territories will be less than two. Now, this is again a very interesting study. I think some of you must have gone through. Usually we believe that the Prince Vital angina or vasospastic angina comes up at rest and produces unstable angina. But this is a very, very interesting study. The name ECOVA, you can see abnormal coronary vessel motion in patients with stable angina and unobstructive coronary artery disease. All these patients have stable angina, angina on effort, and when they're subject to angiography, you can see obstructive lesions more than 50% were seen in 46%, narrowing 20 to 49, uh, 7%, but coronary angiogram in patients with stable angina was seen in 47%, really nearly 50%. And what was very exciting when these patients were submitted to the acetylcholine test, 86% were submitted, the rest were not. And out of these 86%, abnormal coronary vessel motion was seen in 62%. And what is still more exciting, epicardial spasm was seen in 45 and microvascular spasm was seen more than the epicardial spasm in 55. Mind you, these are all patients of stable angina. So how do we diagnose uh, epicardial, one epicardial coronary spasm? All of us are very clear about this. You have a normal angiogram, normal ECG. When you inject acetylcholine, uh, the ST elevation is seen and simultaneously you should also see the spasm of the coronary. How do we diagnose microvascular spasm? The resting electrocardiogram is normal. When you inject acetylcholine, there's no epicardial coronary artery spasm. Electrocardiogram shows ST depression due to subendocardial ischemia. And if you measure coronary lactate production in paired samples from the coronary artery and coronary sinus vein, they are increased. And that is how we diagnose microvascular spasm. And lastly, although we commonly evaluate patients of uh, stable angina or chronic coronary syndrome due to diminished flow, on occasions we are faced with patients who have angina, not because of decrease in blood flow, but because of increased demand. And any patient with a hypertrophic ventricle, all of us know can develop angina even in absence of an epicardial coronary artery stenosis. And hypertension is a very important cause. And angina in these patients develop because of increased oxygen demand due to the hypertrophic left ventricle. There's an inappropriate rise in blood pressure on exercise test. And one of the studies, as you can see in this, is stress echocardiography. The presence of hypertension was associated with 17.6 fold elevated risk of coronary positive results. This is in a stress test from a hypertensive patient. You can see the positive stress test and the angiogram was normal. So in conclusion, what are our options for evaluation of patients of myocardial ischemia and the chronic coronary syndrome? On the top, you can see the bar of the likelihood of obstructive coronary artery disease. If the likelihood is very high on your right side, the red bar, obviously we'll opt for an invasive angiogram. And if the lesion is borderline, we would opt for an additional FFR to see the functional importance of the stenotic lesion. On the other hand, on the left, you can see if the probability is very low, no testing, or you may go on for an exercise treadmill or echo. And if there are doubts raised about the obstructive CAD, we would go for a cardiac CT and if the CT angiography has shown CAD of uncertain functional uh, significance, we would opt for a nuclear myocardial perfusion imaging or a CMR. And this is how we approach in the present scenario. And the message is, please do not only evaluate epicardial coronary artery disease, also look at the microcirculation. There will be various combinations and permutations of both these components of the coronary artery disease. Thank you very much. Dr. Manuria, for this really, really an excellent talk covering um, uh, the whole spectrum of coronary syndrome from a clinical perceptive point of view. How do I reach to a diagnosis? 
and at this particular time i understand from our um, uh, uh, dr uh, mahapatra that we are really running short of time and there is a number of things so we can probably take one question from the audience uh, there is uh, no question in the chat box so 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 what is the whole concept of yours you really presented in a very succinct way and the guide that you put society is also put lot of light in this matter and uh, dr ponde would you like to ask one question yeah no that was a fantastic absolutely superb superb overview of what is going on in cerebral angina right from epicardial stenosis to this i have just one question sir you can just highlight this what percentage of patients you think we should be doing cfr as an as an which which group of patients we should be definitely doing a cfr uh, in today's world if a patient has a normal epicardial coronary arteries and you see slow flow on the coronary arteries the dye does not clear yes. this itself may be self sufficient for diagnosing a microvascular disease but if you want to really document it you have to do a cfr if cfr is less than 2 it clinches the diagnosis of microvascular angina in absence of an epicardial coronary artery the problem is stress telium is also normal in these microvascular so that gives another problem that you have a normal angiogram you have a normal stress test no angina and the patient continues to get angina on effort yes so there are many tests for microvascular angina but this is the test which Best we follow in our day to day practice Dr. Manuria, what, about, flow flow? what about subclinical cad cfr is indicated less than 50% lesions subclinical cad but in the absence of angina or without or with angina in the absence of angina subclinical cad no uh, that everybody that is not agree indications what when i'll be covering the cfr in pet during the course of the uh, talk so i'll definitely cover subclinical cad less than 50% lesion so and in practically most of the cartilages if you find a subclinical cad and the no angina we will just do lifestyle modifications and give yes. them medication which can modify the clot somewhere down the line this is what okay. most of the approach can i come in yeah okay any other so, so dr ponde asks about cfr so uh, the only difference here is uh, if you look at the difference between normal coronaries and intermediate coronary lesion if it is a normal coronary where you don't see any plaque cfr would be more sort of a research and an academic tool to prove that microvascular ischemia there was a slide which showed that okay if the c if your ffr is less than 8 uh, point, uh, if cfr is less than 2 you could stent but you need a lesion to stent so the definition or the indication is there should be intermediate lesion at least 50 to 70% where your ffr or thelem scan might be normal but your cfr is significant you could make a, uh, a case that you might stent increase the flow and it might improve but If a normal coronary is, I think CFR is just an academic tool. Okay, sure, sure. Now, sure. if the patient has angina on upper your epicardial coronary arteries, they are even normal for all practical purposes. If the flow is slow and a CFR is less than two, it will amount to microvascular disease. So you need to treat. So that means we'll carry on with medical the medical treatment, treatment anyway. But medical CFR treatment. is not going to change the treatment. If the coronaries are normal, you're going to give them nitrates. You're going to give them statins. You're going to give them probably ecosprint. uh but it's not going to change the invasive management ha huh, obviously yeah. but the problem is most of the inpatient now masquerades as non cardiac chest pain yep. because angiogram yep. is normal thelium is normal they're not treated yeah. as angina sir, that sir, is the advantage of this sir i can tell you some some of these women have been referred to psychiatrists also yeah saying that they have psych psychiatric disease so i think documenting mm. even for academic purposes as a low cfr will yeah. will, will will give them A, a correct medical and very aggressive medical line of management, including like stent modification, etc. So, thank you very much, sir, thank for you. this uh, wonderful, wonderful, brilliant talk, ah. sir. Thank. You.